Our program is about health and nutrition, and frequently we like to take our program on the road. We go all over the world to different places where people are doing important work. That's because we can't always get them into New York City to our studios. Well, today we're on the road again, and we're interviewing Dr. Lloyd Glauberman. Dr. Glauberman is a unique type of psychologist. Yes, Dr. Glauberman has tried the various forms of psychotherapy with varying degrees of success. But he's different. He's different in that he believes that psychology has to change. It has to break down its own limitations and bring in new technologies. For years, mentioned technology and psychology, and one felt that the other was simply not connectable. The pure scientist said that psychology was too theoretical, too abstract, very subjective. It wasn't a science. The psychologist said that it was an art, not a science, and they didn't want to have any kind of high-tech instrumentation or monitors involved because it would in some way diminish the purity of the therapy and counseling session. So the Gestalt, Adlerin, Rogers, Freudian, Jungian schools resisted new changes. Well, Dr. Glauberman has seen that the door is now open and is entering the area of psychology with some new dynamics. We're going to explore that on today's program. Stay with us. Welcome to our program, Lloyd. Pleasure being here, Gary. Lloyd, you have been a licensed psychologist in New York City for a long time now. You've seen the strengths and weaknesses of your own profession mm -hmm. and its approach, the paradigm. You've taken it beyond that limitation. Could you tell us what that is and show us how it manifests? Okay, let me uh, briefly state my beliefs about psychotherapy. Uh, like you had said, individuals in my business, um, people who are psychotherapists, tend to get into psychotherapy and do one of two things. They either immediately wed themselves to a particular belief system. Um, for instance, psychoanalysis being the dominant belief system in psychotherapy, you will find people who will invest a great deal of time and money in training in becoming psychoanalysts. Uh, once you invest a lot of time and money in something, you tend to continue doing that to justify your belief system. Not that certain psychoanalysts don't do some good work, but one has to question whether the entire belief system has that much relevance. The other choice one has is to essentially um, look around, see what's available in terms of other forms of therapy, other belief systems, and see what can be used. By nature, uh, I am a restless soul, and I began to study what other people were doing. Back in the late 60s and early 1970s, you saw people like Fritz Perls and Eric Byrne, and you heard of encounter groups and things like primal therapy. There was a great deal of emphasis on emotionality. So instead of intellectual insight, there was the getting in touch with one's feelings, expressing one's feelings, being more direct, etc. And both personally and professionally, I tested out a variety of different kinds of things, found some useful for some people under certain circumstances, uh, at times useful for myself, but never particularly found anything that was of value that I would install and say, this is my belief system, this is the truth. After a while, I began to sense that whatever possibly could have happened in terms of psychotherapeutic technique, anything that could transpire between two people, a therapist and a patient, or a therapist and a family, or a therapist and a couple, had already happened. And even though there were new therapies coming on the market and psychologists and other people claiming that there were new things and new treatment forms, in my own belief system, it was really a question of old wine in new bottles. And in a sense, psychotherapy as we know it isn't going to go anywhere at this point. Not that there aren't good people doing good things, but there was never going to be a great psychotherapy. In fact, at this point in time, I think the people who are doing the best quality work in psychotherapy itself are the ones who are borrowing from different psychotherapies, like uh, Dr. Arnold Lazarus at Rutgers University, who has a, uh, a treatment program he calls multimodal psychotherapy. 
It's essentially bits and pieces of different therapy that approaches different aspects of humans' experience, like thinking and feeling, etc. What I did notice was that the individual who seemed to have taken psychotherapy as far as it could be taken was a hypnotist, a clinical hypnotist with a medical background by the name of Milton H. Erickson. Uh, most people who are listening right now probably associate the name Erickson with Eric Erickson, who was a, um, a disciple of Freud and was primarily noted for his theoretical orientation, uh, psychosocial orientation. He was not known primarily for his clinic ability, clinical ability. Milton Erickson, however, who was probably the most videotaped therapist of all time, uh, was known for his technical ability. I need to back up a little bit because in, un in, other, in order to understand Erickson, you need to understand a little bit about hypnosis and you need to understand how his technique differed from what preceded it. For the average viewer right now, when you say the word hypnosis, they tend to think of the following. They tend to think of a unique and discrete altered state of consciousness. They tend to think that while they are in this state called hypnosis, their experience is equivalent to uh, sodium pentothal, as if they are out cold in a state of mind in which when they finally awaken, after they have heard the suggestions of the hypnotist, they'll have the amnesia and they will then spontaneously behave in ways that are appropriate with the suggestions. Um, for people who are familiar with hypnosis, I think what you find out is that hypnosis isn't really like that at all. It is essentially a very normal state of consciousness that people drift in and out of during the average day. Uh, your everyday daydream is a form of trance where you leave external reality where your senses have been focused on what you see and hear and you focus internally so that you're absorbed in an internal reality of thoughts and feelings, images, etc. Uh, that's very normal. And there are times when people are in hypnosis when in fact they might have the amnesia for what happens, but it has nothing to do with uh, an unconscious state of mind. The whole process is very normal, very natural. But classical hypnosis tend, tended to believe that you were putting somebody into the, use, this unique frame of mind, you'd give them direct suggestions, and then they would behave accordingly. Along came, along came Milton Erickson and he said, well, I think there are better ways to do this. And what he essentially did was he developed a, a system of hypnotic technology that focused on the indirect, meaning instead of focusing on your conscious mind, where he would tell you in terms of suggestion exactly how he wanted you to change, his technology, hypnotic technology, was built around bypassing the conscious mind. Now, that sounds somewhat strange because most people think that if you don't hear something or if you don't see something, you can't learn. Well, Erickson has shown us that in fact you can. And when I first started reading his case studies, it seemed very strange because what he would do, and you have to understand this was a man who had polio twice during his life. He recovered both times. Once when he was 15, he almost died. The second when he was 55 years old. Uh, most people began to pay attention to him when he was an older man. So he was already confined to a wheelchair. And uh, people would go to see him in Phoenix, Arizona, like they would go to India to see their favorite guru. And here was this old man sitting in a wheelchair. By that time, his voice was old and somewhat feeble. But still, he still there was that, that certain essence of the man, that certain power. And what he would do would be, while you would be sitting there, he'd start talking in a very slow, gravelly voice and start having, and start talking about when you were little and you were in elementary school, and you used to look around and you saw the letters around the room, and he would mention the big A, and the little A, and the big B, and the little B, etc. And of course, as you're listening, and as he's speaking, you begin to drift inside thinking about um, 
your early childhood experience. And very slowly, you would become absorbed in the kinds of things he was saying. Not only that, but you would be entering that childlike frame of mind. A state of mind obviously more receptive to useful information than the critical adult mind. And then he would begin to tell you stories. Now most people don't think of psychotherapy in terms of listening to stories, but the use of metaphor, the use of stories where each metaphor had a structure to it, and that structure was analogous to the structure of your problem. So that, let's say, there was, you had a problem with interpersonal relationships. Let's say family members were all enmeshed and entangled and people couldn't differentiate from one another and be assertive and stand on their own. He might tell you a story about a number of trees where their roots were all entangled. And during the course of that storytelling, there would be some outcome where the roots managed to disengage from one another and the individual's unconscious mind would perceive the analogy between the structure of the story and the structure of their problem. So the conscious mind wouldn't perceive it, but the unconscious would. After studying Erickson's technology, I said to myself, clearly this man had a handle on something that was very much different than the bulk of what was happening before, because for people who go into psychotherapy, the first thing you get is conscious mind material. Now, not that sometimes that's not useful. It is. But what Erickson offers is another alternative. And using Erickson's, Erickson's technology, I began to think that I don't think anybody can go any further than Erickson did in terms of therapy. As if whatever could have been done, he was already doing. And it was as good as it can get. Where then does the future of psychotherapy or psychotherapeutic adjunct, adjuncts lie? I happen to think it's in the area of technology. And I think, as you mentioned earlier, uh, people say, oh, Jesus, goodness gracious, you know, we, we, we can't have brain machines or we can't have things that are going to influence us. Uh, those same people probably didn't think that the computer was going to make a very big impact. And yet, as we know, that's part and parcel of our culture today, will always be and um, will be more influential as time goes on. There's an inevitability to this. Well, there is a certain amount of psychotechnology available for people who are interested in, in what is available. Uh, there's a book by Michael Hutchinson called Megabrain, which I suggest reading. But my own particular area, my own interest, uh, was in the area of audio psychotechnology, in audio tapes. And I have been working on an idea that has evolved over the past five years or so. And it began out of the use of, um, of a flotation tank, which I, a number of years back, had installed in my practice. Now, for people who don't know what a float tank is, it is an enclosed vessel. And the original flotation tanks, the wet float tanks, were constructed so that there was saline solution, six inches or so, with a heavily concentrated amount of saline, uh, six, 700 pounds in 10 inches of water, so that an individual would in fact lie back and float on the surface much like it was the Dead Sea. My interest in the flotation tank was primarily because of the state of mind that it was able to generate. Uh, most people probably haven't read much about it or maybe not having experienced it, but there are different brain waves that human beings experience. Um, the brain can go through beta, alpha, theta, and into sleep. Most times, when you're in your normal waking state, you are in beta, which is your active conscious mind, logical processing, the state of consciousness most people are in right now as they listen to me talk. As you get more relaxed, you go into alpha. And alpha happens to be um, a state of mind most people tend to associate, it, associate with deep relaxation. However, for those people who really understand deep relaxation and perhaps have studied some of the literature and the research that is done uh, with yogis, what they find is those people go beyond alpha state into the theta state. Now the theta state is really the in-between state between waking and sleep. Uh, it is a transitional state of mind. Everybody goes through it twice during the course of every 24-hour period. You go through it as you go to sleep, 
but most people are unaware of it, and you go through it, uh, when you come out of sleep into your normal waking state, uh, occasionally you might be aware of it, most of the time not. There has been enough research to show that the theta state is probably the state of mind which is most beneficial in terms of receptivity for useful information. As a matter of fact, there is a, uh, a psychologist by the name of Tom, Tom Budzinski who has developed a uh, machine called the Twilight machine, Twilight State machine, uh, Twilight Consciousness machine, where he will wire you up to an EEG and then while you are listening to ocean waves and you drift down into the theta state, as soon as you're in theta, he'll begin playing you tapes that have useful information. When you drop out, the tapes will then stop until you drop back into theta. Theta is, from my own experience, the ideal state of mind in terms of receptivity. Sometimes people in hypnosis will be in the theta state. That's probably when they're most receptive to incoming information. So it was this state of consciousness that I thought was probably ideal to combine with the Ericksonian hypnosis, which I had been studying. And I began doing that. Um, at the same time, I began being interested in another concept, and that is subliminal perception. Now, I want to preface my discussion of that by saying I have my doubts at this point in time about the efficacy of auditory subliminal perception and have moved away from it. But at this point in time, as I tell the story, I said to myself, well, perhaps, because I read the literature in subliminal perception, and the auditory literature in subliminal perception was not strong. Visual subliminal perception offered you um, some success in terms of symptomatology, lessening anxiety levels. The auditory research did not support uh, the use of, uh, of, of audio tapes that um, are surrounding us these days. In any event, I thought perhaps that the reason that the subliminals didn't have enough cloud was that they needed something to be associated with it. So I decided to create a concept in conjunction with another psychologist by the name of Phil Halbeth, where we took the idea of Ericksonian hypnosis and added one particular twist to it. That twist was the idea of the dual or double hypnotic induction. Again, for those people who have no background in hypnosis, a dual hypnotic induction means that instead of one hypnotist talking to you, there are two, both talking simultaneously, one in your left ear, one in your right ear. What happens is this creates a very pleasant form of stimulus overload. There's simply too much information for the conscious mind to process. So what typically happens is people tend to drift away from the voices, drift inside in a very profoundly relaxed state. After reading about the dual induction and after having used it in conjunction with, with Phil Halbeth, with people, we found that in fact it was what we believe to be the most profound hypnotic induction procedure there was. So we decided to incorporate the dual hypnotic induction with the Ericksonian approach to hypnosis using metaphors and then beneath the surface include a layer of subliminal messages. We did just that. We purchased a four track machine and we began to use the technology. We found after a while that number one the sensory overload effect was wonderful for, for triggering the relaxation response. But the subliminal messages didn't seem to have any impact at all. What we did notice was that occasionally people would respond to audible sentence fragments that were part of the stories that were being told. For instance, I was treating a patient for depression. And during the course of the treatment, I decided to give him a self-esteem tape to take home, one of these original hypnosubliminal tapes that we were working with. Sent him home, and he came back three weeks later. And uh, as I start off most sessions, I asked whether anything interesting had happened during the course of this three weeks, because I hadn't seen him in a while. He says, well, I had one small change. And I said, what was that? He said, well, I don't get any more panic attacks when I come to New York. I said to myself, that's real interesting. 
Um, this man never told me. He had panic attacks. I was wondering, how did this happen? I've never cured anybody of this problem without knowing I was focusing on it. And certainly without knowing that it existed to begin with. So when that person left that day, I went back and I reread the script. I reread the script. And what I found was that in one of the stories about a boy walking along in the city, there was a sentence fragment which said, as the boy walked along, he began to feel more and more comfortable in the city. This sentence fragment, feeling more comfortable in the city, had absolutely nothing to do with the therapeutic intent of this particular tape. It was simply part of the story. But what obviously happened was, this man's unconscious mind, obviously in need of hearing something just like that, being in a relaxed state, by that I mean with these two stories going on simultaneously, he had drifted away from the content and consciously didn't hear those words on a conscious level, but obviously on an unconscious level. Obviously, being the person who is intimately involved with the idea, I'm biased in the way I look at things, and certainly I'm biased in the way I look at this concept. There have been other people, other professionals, who have had the opportunity of using this in their practices, in their small uh, pilot research projects, one of which I would like to mention because I think it has particular relevance in, this, in, in the age in which we live. A psychiatrist from Sacramento by the name of uh, Michael Dolnick purchased my original series of tapes a year ago. I hadn't heard from him in 10 months. About a month ago, he called me up and he told me he had some interesting news. And I said, what was it? He said, well, we've been using your tapes as part of a program for eight gay men who had tested positive for the AIDS virus. Now, this was not a carefully controlled research project. Rather, it was a pilot program. They use these tapes, they use some other tapes, they use some didactic materials in terms of uh, health practices, nutrition, etc. After three months of listening, two of the men in the project had an opportunity to have their T levels checked. Uh, and after they were analyzed, what they found was that both of these men had significant increases in T cell count. Two individuals who had pain didn't have any more pain anymore. The quality and the quantity of sleep had improved for everybody, and everybody's overall sense of well-being had improved considerably. So while this was only a pilot program, it is clearly, off it clearly offers suggestive evidence that there are alternative technologies that are now available to help people. And it is my belief that hypnoperiphal processing, again, as an adjunct to therapy, as a self-help idea in and of itself, it can be very useful. And over the course of the next year, this should be some additional research that will be available to substantiate some of the ideas that I presented to you now. Uh, that's primarily the overall view of hypnoperiphal processing, and I think it's an idea um, that will someday be, be useful for, for many, many people. Lloyd, let me ask you. If what I hear you saying is correct, a person could take a tape, mm -hmm. uh, could listen to the tape, and where their conscious mind would lock or block any suggestion that they deal with this underlying problem, with the tape it allows them to get underneath the problem. That's exactly correct. To give you a quick example, I recently been working with an individual who has an explosive temper. Uh, the first session he comes in with his hand all bandaged because he had smashed a wall, banged up his knuckles. Uh, so I saw clearly this was a problem that needed some attention very quickly because he was recently separated and needed, and I needed to make sure that this guy wasn't going to be violent in any way. I gave him a tape to take home. He didn't listen to my office. He didn't listen to the tape in my office. The tape was a stress management tape. In the tape, he heard the message three times, stop blowing up, in the context of stop in one story, blowing up a balloon in another story. His conscious mind never heard that message. Unconsciously, he did, and he responded to it. Excellent. 
Dr. Lloyd Glauberman, my guest. Dr. Lloyd Glauberman is on West 86th Street in New York City. I'm Gary Nall, on location, a little noise in the background from all the boats. We'll be back next week exploring more on health and nutrition. Until then, stay healthy and stay well. Thank you, Lloyd.